Well, good afternoon, everyone. We got a moment here to get the projector going. So I'm having flashbacks. I feel like the last time I was in this hall, it was 35 years ago. And 35 years ago, we were with Joni Rose. Anybody know Joni Rose, right? Right? And with Hal and with Dawn, and we were putting on the production of Peter Pan. Does anyone remember my central character role? I had the best role because I got to jump off the stage. I didn't get to fly, but I got to jump off the stage because I was the crocodile. Can we sit over here? It was really cool. All right, let's see. We're, we're getting here. We're getting here. Um, so as you know, I grew up in this town, and it's a real pleasure to, to be back. I spend a lot of my time thinking about the fire preparedness space and working all over California, trying to help communities understand their risks, how to manage the hazards, and how to... Let me put this together a little bit. It is doing weird things. It's actually, I might need a little help thing in this thing. Okay. All right. Give me a second here. So, what is a forester doing in the fire space? It's an odd question, I know, but my work and my career, I've spent 23 years in education and trying to help communities solve common problems. And along those, along those years, I got the opportunity to work with this gentleman here, Dr. Steve Quarles, and he brought me into the fold of thinking about how uh, fire affects buildings and what might happen when we expose buildings to, to wildfire. And we used to throw events, and you know how many people we'd get to show up? No, we'd get five. It was this, this time frame where people just, you know, like, it was just a few of the folks in the fire professional space, and the community generally wasn't that interested because, you know, they didn't feel like it would affect them. So most of our fires in California have taken place in Southern California, and it really wasn't until the Oakland Hills Fire in 1991, which I happened to live in Oakland during, and then fast forwarding to the Tubbs Fire in Santa Rosa, where we really had an epiphany, and we had an awakening in this space. And I think most of us have gone through this experience of feeling like, holy heck, if it can happen there, if, it can, if a fire can pass over eight lanes of freeway, how can I protect myself? There is just no way that I can make sense of this. So I spent uh, a bunch of time really working in this space and trying to understand what happens. This is the Marshall Fire, that's the Rocky Mountains. Some of you might remember the Marshall Fire that uh, took place on uh, New Year's Eve in Colorado in 2021. Uh, we're there just 15 days later trying to figure out what happened. In all of that, I'm gonna get to my punchline. My punchline is written here. There is tremendous reason for hope. And how can I say that? Because we now understand really what the mechanism of exposure is and how we can mitigate and break those pathways and make a difference. So what I want to do over the next 30 or so minutes is sort of talk about how we've come to those conclusions and try and provide practical and achievable actions that you all can take on your individual properties and in your individual homes and really in helping lift those around you and those who are most in need. So I love it when there's interaction. I don't want to just I'm gonna take this out. I'm gonna, I love it when there's interaction and we can have a lot of fun in this space. So, what is the most important thing that you should be doing right now in preparing for wildfire? What are you guys thinking about? Defensible space. What else? Water storage. Water storage. Hardening homes. Hardening homes. Evacuation plan. Evacuation plan. Knowledge. Knowledge. Here. Burning, burning what? Slash. Burning what towels had. Okay. What else? Make sure your insurance premium is paid. Ah, <laughs> excellent, Manny. He's representing the insurance industry today. So, <laughs> good, good, good. What else? Community organizing. Community organizing. Attending events like today. Contact lists. Support your fire department. Support your fire department. Go bags. Go bags. What's in your go bag? 
to my kids, my passport. Excellent. Everybody hear that? <laughs> what else? Registering for emergency alerts. Registering for emergency alerts. Thank you, Brian, from Office of Emergency Services. <laughs> Anything else? Anyone checked in on their neighbors? Anyone thought about who might be vulnerable? Yes. Setting up neighborhood mailing lists and contact lists and figuring out what your procedure is? Yes. Yep. <laughs> Preparation for the pets. Anybody have a plan on what they're going to do with their pet? Okay, here's the next question. Where are you going to be when the wildfire starts? Who knows? Where are you going to be? Are you going to be in Eureka? Are you going to be in Garberville? Are you going to be home? Where are you going to be? Any of those places. On a fire truck. Thank you for your service. So the majority of people that I ask where they're going to be when the wildfire starts, what do you think the answer is? Home. What if you're not home? What I want to talk about today are things that you can do when you're not home. Because most of us expect that we will be able to be home, that we're going to have the alert system with enough warning, that we'll have been able to do a few things, button some stuff up, and have this orderly stepwise progression and actuate our plans, right? It's unlikely. It's very unlikely. I meet all kinds. I just, there's this lovely couple I work with in Santa Cruz County, and they have a binder. The binder is what to do when all hell breaks loose. They open it up, they have really nice checklists about what they do at what hour and how it works because it's terrifying, right? And you're panicked in that moment. But they are so committed to the idea that they are going to be home. And I said, well, what if you got bit by a rattlesnake? What if you sprained your ankle? What if you're just not home? No, we do not leave during the summer months. Okay. <laughs> okay. But just humor me for a second. So think about the things that you can do when you leave during fire season to go to town, to get what you need, to go visit someone. You know, what condition do you leave your home in? So that relates to things like our pet doors, our skylights, those openings that we leave because we like the fresh air and we like all those things. But that may be your last point that you're at your, your property. Okay, good stuff. So we're in a really existential crisis right now. I mean, think about this. One out of every eight acres in California has burned in the last, in the last year. 43,000 structures have been damaged or destroyed. Uh, and then a whole lot of people in that way. So how is that that we make change, right? And to me, the economic losses are pale in comparison to the social losses. I think you can probably imagine how many transplants we've gotten from Paradise in the last several years. I mean, it is a, it is a very different community now. Um, and so what I just want to bring forward is that this stuff happens overnight in many ways. Uh, in 2021, I got to do a um, workshop with the Mendocino Fire Safe Council, and it was with uh, a property that um, the gentleman was 93. And it was part of their program where they were trying to work with those who were most in need. And it was really cool. So we came out and we did a home inspection and then we brought crews to do work and did a bunch of stuff like in eight hours with an eight person crew, could we make it better? And unfortunately, so here I was there August 18th and September 13th, that's what the property looked like. Arsonist ignited a a fire in one of the creek beds a quarter mile away, and this gentleman was in the pathway. It happens overnight. Good news is he got out, let me just say that, but he will never go back to, to that home. So how we can lift these folks and lift us at the same time? So here I told you Christina was gonna get a little philosophical. So I've been thinking about this. I've been thinking about kale lately. You're going to ask me why, and I've been thinking about car seats lately, and I've been thinking about wildfire and welfare mitigation. This may be going out there a little bit on a limb, but, you know, I've been thinking about the concept of social change and what it really takes to motivate and take action. If you look at the history of car seats, or seatbelts in particular, I don't, there are many of you that are older than me, but I remember that my dad's 1962 Ford Falcon only came with front seatbelts. 
uh, it didn't come with rear seat belts. And we started really the, the seat belt industry focusing in on adults, uh, and children came later. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, and then there were some boosters for a while to try to make it easier for, for children to be able to see a little bit. That was the next effort. Do you know who was the first car manufacturer for seat belts? Saab, followed by Volvo. That's kind of cool. But the whole idea of using car seats for infants is rather terrifying, right? I don't know if you had that first experience like I did. Um, I was not. I was not born in homes, born in the Garberville Hospital. My children were both born in Arcata. And, you know, you get that brand new baby. And they're so, they want to be so tight. And, you know, you swaddle them up and you're, you know, you've got this little thing that's so compressed. And the chance you get to go home, you somehow have to have, have to hit that seat belt, that car seat. And the last thing you want to do is unswaddle them and like let their legs uncurl to put the five point harness on, right? It's the worst experience ever. I think I wanted to like hold onto them or stick them in a box with a little nest, you know, something like that. But how did I actually embrace that? Let's see, how did I actually embrace that car seat? I went to a training class and a nurse walked out with me to make sure that I put my kid in the car seat appropriately. That's how social change happens. That's the point, the very first point of contact with that child was in a car was in a, was with an infant car seat. Will my kids wear seat belts for the rest of their life? Absolutely, because they've been habituated to it the whole time. When you buy your first home, does a nurse come with you and talk to you about the safety features on the home? What the maintenance requirements are, how to care and burp and feed and, and make sure your home is in good shape? No. The real estate agent gives you your keys and says, good luck. And hopefully your parents are there and a few family members. But where do you get information at this point? You know, it's just interesting. I'm bringing it forward because this idea of what does it take to make social change, it really takes a radical transformation from a very significant stage. And so why kale? Because where the hell did kale come from? I mean, 25 years ago, except for in our community, it was mostly a decorative salad green uh, that the bowls of lettuce and other things were put on top. But now, how many of you have eaten kale in the last month? Like, who the hell decided kale was really an edible vegetable, right? And did you know there's actually a real book called Fifty Shades of Kale? There is. I'm not joking. I'm not making this up. So if we can make kale sexy, we sure as hell can make this stuff seem achievable. And kale was done with a mass gorilla campaign, marketing campaign, and that's what I think it's going to take. The term home hardening, it's pretty blah, right? We've really got to make a social movement out of this and have people understand that this is worth the investment, that this kale is good for your body, and that it's a superfood and it's going to make a difference in your life. In the same way that we think about that from fire. So that's what I've been pondering. A little bit philosophical, maybe not worth it, but... Anyway, so today what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what we understand about how buildings are exposed to wildfire and what those pathways are and how we can make a difference. I want to review some recent wildfires to give us some evidence to understand where these concepts are coming from, and then I want to lead with some key actions. So in 2006, uh, there was the revision of the Defensible Space Guidance for California, and we went from 30 feet to 100 feet. And these were the graphics that were used to communicate what people were needing to do. So when you look at this, what does it tell you? Your landscape should not be primary. Your primary should be keeping the people away from your home. Okay, so there's some separation there. What else does it tell you? To me, it tells me that I live in a wood house, <laughs> which works for our community for the most part. What do you think, Yale? No, your, your house is in the woods by yourself. <laughs> There's a very large tree within 30 feet of your house. There's a very large tree about you know, 20 feet away. Also says that you're in a conifer forest, aren't you? Yeah. How many people in California live in a conifer forest? A few of us, right? But the rest of the state, not that many people live in conifer forest. So the messaging was, you're going to live in a log house in the woods, you're going to live in a, in a conifer forest, and a forest fire is what's going to burn your house down. How do you explain the Tubbs fire? How do you explain the Marshall fire? How do you explain what's happening in all these communities if this has been our met this has been the way that we've been trying to communicate what the fire issue is? We missed the mark. So now it's a process 
to try and sort of detangle this issue. Do you know that the majority of homes are lost in vegetation types other than forests? So it's easy to understand why we didn't think this was important. What we were really trying to say with that is that if you get a wildfire approaching in the forest coming towards you, if you separate the trees and you reduce the fuel ladders, that that fire will climb down to the ground, spread across, and be at a place where some of our amazing fire professionals are going to be able to take action and defend your home. It was about how do we make space for our professionals to make a difference for us. That's what we were trying to say. How to make a defendable property. If we're fortunate to have folks available for us, then that model works. But where are resources when things get rough? Those resources are helping us get out of the way, making sure the evacuations are going orderly, helping us with all the other things, not necessarily working on the individual protection of a home. So now we understand that there's a whole bunch of different types of exposures that we need to think about. So we were just talking about direct flame contact, this idea that the fire is coming towards the house and that we should be able to interrupt that pathway, right, by doing fuel reduction. But we also now know there's two other types of fire exposures. One of them is embers, and we've got some great graphics back there to be able to look at and some illustration of that with the, the home over here. So there's this idea that pieces of vegetation can be picked up in the fire column and move. And it also can be pieces of the built environment that can get picked up and moved. Following the Tubbs fire, I saw two by fours, I saw big chunks, things you can hardly imagine could get lifted in the air column big stuff being moved. And then there's this other concept called radiant heat. Anybody know what radiant heat is? Right, it transfers through the air. You don't necessarily have physical contact. Um, it's a little bright in here, but the idea is that it's strong enough or high enough intensity that it might break a window. And then you've got a new pathway in. Right. So in our fire protection head now, we need to be thinking about these three types of exposures to make sure that we've managed each of those potential exposures. So it's more than just defensible space, right? So just some illustration of embers and what they might look like. This is from Paradise. And you know, they're moving horizontally, they're moving vertically, and they are moving in the air column and landing in all the little nooks and crannies. And you may not see a flaming front at all. Like this looks like it was an interior house fire, right? This is the Angora fire up in Lake Tahoe. It looks like, I don't know, a space alien came down and zapped that house or there's an interior fire. But in reality, it could have been just as easily the cat door left open, the skylight, the windows, any number of things, and a pathway in. How about this image? What do you guys see in this image? Yeah, poor firefighter. He's got a lot of work to do. What do you see? Burning or vegetation. What else do you see? A stucco building that's not wood and burning up as the vegetation catches fire. The building itself hasn't ignited yet. What do you see, Harry? Bark mulch. Bark mulch. Mm -hmm. What else do you see? Hot spots. Hot spots. Mm -hmm. These guys. What else? Wind. Look at this. Look at the air column here. Look how it's circling. Look at this one. It's going this way. You can imagine how you can get embers into the under events once you see this kind of circulation pattern, right? Why is it so bright along there? Not the gas line. Dried grass, maybe. Aromatic herbs, potentially. Because the wind is blowing them to the wall, they hit the wall, and they drop down. So they're collecting, the embers are basically collecting at the base of the house. Exactly. There's a lot of that image. It tells us a lot about the kinds of exposures that we might, we might have to our buildings. And the question I have is, could something be done that would make a difference here? Could have a concrete front yard. Could. Non-flammable from zero to five. Non-flammable from zero to five. 
on board with that. Anything else? What'd you say? Nice to have some water, absolutely. <laughs> Sprinklers. Does this tree bother you? Not that much, not at the moment, no. I mean, it's got no, no branches down here. It is separated from the building. These, on the other hand, much more problematic. So I want you to go home today and think about if you had a, a stick matches, I just want you to think about it and ignited those and threw them at your house and the base of your house, how would you feel? Stupid. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> the point when you feel like if I were to throw and I had ignition at the base of my house and I would be okay, that's when you know you've got the meter. Uh, are those windows over the transom there? Yeah. Yes. But, but not for long. Why do you say that? Maybe not. I don't think so. Unless you had a lot of heat exposure here, those windows are going to be doing just fine. Okay. So I need to work with this, this group, the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, and they have this uh, lab that's four times bigger than this room. And they have what's called an ember generator, and they've got wind turbines behind it, and they can send all different kinds of wind, and blasts and gusts, sustained, and then they build buildings, uh, and we get to test different, different aspects of it. So you can see how the embers are blasting into the wall, the landing at the base. Look at the spread as it comes out around the corner. Corners have more vulnerability than you might think. So see that spray line there? And what I'm going to do next, and you probably have seen this, but I want you to think about the time exposure that comes on this. Three seconds, we've already got ignition, so let's see if I can do this right. 11 seconds, you've already got ignition underneath the deck. See how the flame spreads coming around the corner? 17 seconds in, it's running up the wall to the under eave area, compared to the hardy plank, the hardy cement board and gravel over here. 27 seconds, we've got direct flame contact on the building, We've got climbing the wall, 32 seconds in. This process can happen really quickly. 40 seconds in, we've got under eave area exposed. We're starting to go for the gable and vent. All of that is coming off the corner there. So the research that's come out of this lab has suggested that three feet's pretty sufficient, five feet's way better but on the corners you get more vulnerability. Seven feet would be even better of clearance around the house. I think that gives you an illustration of what the particular challenges are. What I would love to see as a comparison is this, um, this side being actually wood, but with the gravel at the base. That would give us the better answer around what we might be experiencing in our own structures. I would argue that with this non-combustible zone, we would, we would see the exact same outcome that you see here. This base condition is more important than anything. If you can manage the combustibles near that area, you can create the same effect. Question? In that, those were like 25 to 30 mile an hour gusts. So moderate. What we saw in the, um, the Marshall Fire in Colorado, over 100 mile an hour gusts, we saw about 35 to 40 mile an hour gusts with the campfire in Paradise. So there, there are a variety of locations of, in our buildings that are very vulnerable. And I'm going to talk through some of those. We're going to talk about roof to wall intersections. Anybody have a complex roof where they've got walls that are in the roof plane? Okay, a few of you. Nope. Do you notice the leaf litter accumulation in that section? Anyone figured out how to manage that? <laughs> Metal roof, leaf blower. What about the siding that's right there and the flashing right that's right there? Anyone have plastic rain gutters? No. Nope. Yeah, a couple. Anyone have metal rain gutters? Yep. Yeah. What this example was suggesting is this is plastic versus this is metal. The plastic gutters will ignite as will the metal rain gutters, but the plastic gutters will lead to melting 
and they fall off the building and then they change the exposure from the roof edge to, to the base of the building. Anyone have a, a wooden fence that connects to their house? Mm -hmm. Pretty close, right? So here's from the Tubbs fire, this is Santa Rosa, this is how the fire is coming to the house, the fence ignited, brought the fire there. And then these bottom two planes are from inside of a structure. This is the lab structure, and you can see the gable end vent here and the under eave vent, and these are the embers coming through those vent screens and landing in the attic. Anybody store anything in their attic? Mm-hmm. Yep. Anybody want to change what might be stored in their attic? I do. Well, so we're going to talk about some of those things, but to get into that, I want to just give you some thought about some of the recent wildfires and some of the issues that we, we might want to pay attention to. So I'm going to talk about Paradise. Uh, this is an actual heat map image of, from the town of Paradise. This is the east side. The fire ignites at 5.55, I think, in the morning from power line failure. This image is taken at 10.45. Uh, it moved to the edge of town within an hour and a half. Uh, this is November, 5.55 in the morning is their daylight in November. No. What time's the sunrise in November? Seven-ish, right? So by the time sunrise comes out, we already have wildfire in the town of Paradise that morning. These are the three arteries and one way out that way and one way this way. Uh, so here's at 10 o'clock and you can already see that there were spot fires all over the place and we're closing off every evacuation route in that town. When you look at the condition um, of the vegetation and the homes, this image tells me a heck of a lot. Anyone see anything in here that's interesting? Green foliage. Yeah, there's green trees. What, did, what does that tell you, Dave? That the uh, fire was being spread house to house, not by the vegetation. Right, because if all the green was brown, then it would have been moving through if these trees were all engaged, then you wouldn't have living trees left, right? And so you can see the places where the, the former footprints of these homes are, and you can see that there's actually more damage to the trees from where the homes were than, than through the overstory in the other locations. So what this really says is that there's, there's quite a community effect that happens from one building to the next. And we went back and looked at the damage data, and we saw of the damage but not destroyed, 60% of them were from radiant heat. And it makes a lot of sense because you can see that these, these homes are, can be quite close to each other. The average lot size in Paradise is an acre and a half. Doesn't mean that the, home, the lots aren't long and skinny like the ones in the image over there in Garberville. You know, people don't just own square lots, they own different shapes of lots and that can put houses close to each other. More illustration of the neighborhood effect you know, where you can see that somehow you've got an ignition somewhere in that block, which have kind of a, a relationship effect to those other buildings, where in this setting, something prevented ignition, and as, as a result, the whole community was able to hold together. So to me, this share, share, or illustrates kind of our shared responsibility, and this idea that our neighbor's condition may have more effect on us than we realize, and the idea of how do we lift each other together. Right? These, are, these are complicated sets of interactions between buildings, and it may not be somebody else's building. It could be your woodshed, your pump shed, your garage, any number, barn. But just thinking about the relationship of buildings to each other is key. So we did a lot of analysis trying to understand what was the effect, uh, what contributed to loss, and we were particularly interested because in Paradise, they um, have 150 homes or so that were built after the new exterior construction codes were developed. So in 2008, we now have um, standards for buildings to resist wildfire. You might have heard of them. We talk about it in Chapter 7A. A little bit nerdy, but we were curious. Like, had, with homes that being built under that new standard, how did their survival um, play out? And did we see any, any trends? And what we learned that survival probability and this is kind of a complicated statistical analysis, but it's, it's reflected well, I think, in, in the idea that the first split of survival probability is best explained by distance to nearest destroyed building. Meaning that if there was a building that was within 50 feet or 18 meters 
of another structure, that was the strongest predictor about survival or loss. 50 feet. Christina, how far is the closest building to you? 50 feet. 50 feet. That's about that. Okay, that's pretty good. In my current house right now, I think I got 12, 12 feet. I have some things to think about. We all have things to think about here. The next strongest predictor was then the canopy cover farther away. Uh, and then your build comes down as, as part of the relationship. So 73% probability of survival when homes were greater than 18 meters or 50 feet away from each other had sort of moderate canopy cover and are built more moderately built. Only 7.5% of homes met that set of conditions. Right, there were 18,000 structures lost in the campfire. So it's a big population set. What we saw, though, is when you looked at the effect of the construction code, this is when the construction code is implemented between 2008 and 2018, you can see that there's greater probability, of, there's greater survival, but there isn't a strong statistical difference between the decade before and the, and the period of the new construction code. And part of what explains that is, what's the service life on a roof? 25 to 30 years. So homes that were 20 years old are still well in their period of service life. 20 years ago, did we have single pane or double pane windows? Double. Mostly double pane. So our newer ways of building uh, are we're more likely to see survival in general just because of the different styles of construction we're doing, the different materials, and that they last that long. When you look at older homes, you know, have they had their roofs replaced? What exactly might be happening there? It's hard, it's hard to know. Okay, so now let's fast forward to the Marshall Fire. And I just want to compare the difference between, so that was a of a forest fire, and this is a grassland fire. The Marshall Fire is December 30th, 2021. This is Boulder, Colorado. That's the fire actually burning through town. Um, how do you create privacy in an open plain community? Fences. The vegetation, yeah. What else? Fences. Fences, right? There's no natural topography really to create separation between, between houses, and so you make it, right? Um, so, I was there trying to get after the question of, okay, we lost these houses in this section of the block, but not these houses. Was there something about their style of construction that made them more likely to survive than, than these homes here? So we were curious about that transition process. And so what did we see? There was nothing different about the construction between those homes and the ones that were lost and the ones that weren't. Really, what it was about was that there was some type of response that helped extinguish the transmission of fire from one to the next. And what we learned is that it's a really fancy place. <laughs> People have wooden fences everywhere to create privacy and security for their animals, their children, you know, create their, their, their special place. But what we got is we had embers being moved and they landed on receptacle grass. It was December 31st, there was dry grass. Uh, and those embers landed at the bases of these fences. These fences ignited and brought fire basically to the structures. Had lots of reports of exactly that process happening and community members coming together and, and basically preventing that, that continuance. Other thing was kind of interesting is to look at different construction styles. So these are uh, a home sequence from um, homes that were built in 2020, 2020. Uh, these are condos. This was another condo complex. The fire suppression folks decided to make this pathway the line of defense and hold the line there. And when you drill in, you can think about all the heat that came off of those multi-buildings here. You can see that these condos had a lot of heat exposure. And what we have here is a side-by-side -side comparison of annealed versus tempered glass. Anyone know what annealed glass is? Anyone have annealed glass in their house? You all have annealed glass in your house. Annealed glass is the most common glass that's available. It breaks in shards. Um, and so you won't see it on a, a, a sliding glass door because we do have a tendency to occasionally walk through sliding glass doors when the door's closed, right? It's really bad. And so you change the composition of that glass so it breaks in a different way. There's an added benefit, though, that tempered glass has three times the resistive heat capacity that annealed glass has. So here's this. Great comparison, the tempered glass versus the annealed glass. And what do we see? The annealed glass failed, as we would expect. And the tempered glass held together and kept the, kept the heat and the flames from entering that building. So 
Just to give you a, a real visual image of how these things perform, it's really cool. Anyone know how to look for tempered glass? Well, you can do that. And so that was always that'll always work. <laughs> the little bead. So all of your sliding glass doors should have tempered glass in them, so you can go down and look at them. Generally, right in the little corner, there'll be a little etch in it. It might not say tempered, but there'll be an etch in it. So you can go look and see if you have it. Tempered glass is slightly more expensive than annealed glass. You have to special order it. Um, and it looks like most of the suppliers in California are now selling both paints tempered. Because you can order one paint, inside or outside paint tempered, but the best course of action would be both paints tempered. If you, had to ch if you didn't have that option, I would keep the interior paint tempered and then have like a storm door of the annealed glass on the outside. Okay. So just some more illustration of how these fences ignited, how they got into the retaining walls and brought flame to the, to the structures. Here's another, um, it's kind of cool. Um, so this home did have firefighter response on it so we can see some of the surrounding um, or the, the remaining elements of the structure. This was a golf course on this side and it was grassy. The flames and wind were coming this way and what happened is the embers came over, got into the grass, spread slowly forward. This is a wrapped um, stucco wall with wood members. It's got um, hardware cloth at the base to keep the golf balls out from hitting the neighbors. And it serves as a sieve collecting debris. So the fire came up, got to that sieve, caught the debris that was there. You can see the fence that was here and then had a right hand corner. So it burned the fence and then came to so the same view. That's the house that survives next door. Fence comes this way. You get flames and you get flames to the under eave area and you have uh, a wood fascia and then um, <clears throat> some hardboard under here that ignites even though this is a stucco house and you get flames into the attic. Is that preventable? Yeah. yeah. It is. It's definitely preventable and how, how would we have made that different? Stucco fence. Well, we've got a stucco fence here. Right, so you could have just changed the attachment point here. Fence could have stayed, just change the attachment point to something that's less, less combustible. Another example, same, same house, but from a different spot, rock mulch, and we've got two types of woody vegetation. Wind is coming this way. It's garbage day, by the way. Most of the wildfires that I've been to, it's always garbage day. <laughs> Just, just the weird thing. But what it does is it creates more debris that ends up everywhere and can ignite. What's unusual about this to me is that you don't have a surface fire in the rock mulch here, but the way that this um, decorative conifer held its needles, you have a lot, a lot of dry, dry debris in it. So the debris could ignite within the standing tree, and then we had fire within it, and then we were again exposed to the underneath area. So think about pathways. Same here, and then you've got the... Um, the foundation vents that, and you can see the heat exposure on that. So is this fixable? Yeah. It's fixable. It's quite. The last thing I want to say, and I'm not going to dig in too deeply, but assembly matters. So the way that the walls are constructed, the way that the roof is assembled, all of that matters. So this was a stucco house, but the way it was constructed, it wasn't wrapped in plywood. It wasn't sheathed in plywood. It wasn't sheathed in OSB. It was sheathed in fiberboard, which you can see the piece of the fiber. If you took a um, mirror and looked at the base of where the wall came down, here's the stucco, here's the fiberboard, and here's the cement foundation. This was sticking out. It might be stucco, but it is as vulnerable as any product out there because it's uh, got an unprotected edge there. So if you had ignition at the base of the wall because the embers crashed into it, and you had some kind of flame, it would be really easy to catch that layer that's just inside the stucco wall on fire. So assembly matters, and you gotta understand how things are constructed. The good news is that they mostly had cement right up to the house, so they had a way to kind of protect that. So just thinking about these details. Not everyone has stucco, but you'll hear folks to say, well, I have a metal roof, I have stucco, I'm fine. Well, maybe, it just depends on how those pieces work, how you've protected their vulnerable edges, and how you can prevent exposures to this. All right, so key actions. This is where we've been at from a defensible space perspective. 
you know, there's a lot of things that are right here, right? We've got mowed grass, we've got green grass, we don't have fuel ladders. But what we do see is that this house is wrapped in woody vegetation. So my current eyes, when I look at this, say, we got part of the equation right, but we've got a lot more room to, to work on it. So you'll see that there are changes coming in California regulation, uh, and there is now the creation of three zones of defensible space, and that's in part coming out of our understanding around embers and radiant heat. And so you'll see this transition now to, we call it zone zero, uh, and so it's interrupting what was been our traditional 30, foot, 30 feet of defensible space and wrapping the entire perimeter of the building. So any a deck is included as a part of the building, any stairwells can be part of the building, so you can see how it gets bulb out here. And this is in response to that video that I was just showing you around how the embers land. And, you know, it's not meant to, to, to reduce your privacy or your aesthetics or any of those things. It's really meant to, if you're not there and the firefighters aren't there for you, what can you do to put your house in the best position possible? Seem icky? Seem okay? What do you all think? It's going to be a little rough, isn't it? It's going to be rough. My mom hates me. <laughs> we talk about that regularly, and I listen, and I nod, and I, we talk about it. But <clears throat> hopefully you can help your community members understand that this is important. So the new regulations will be coming. We'll start to see our DSI inspectors through CAL FIRE begin to recommend it, and then at some point it will go on the books and it will be a requirement. But getting our headspace around how do we find beauty and privacy in this space, the idea is more about how to create islands of focal points, islands where you can concentrate the vegetation, and it's maybe right outside your window, because that's where you want it, you know, a little bit separated from the house, but it's what you look at when you drive up to your property, it's what you look at when you're sitting at your kitchen table. Think about where you look, as maybe where the vegetation goes as opposed to where the vegetation doesn't. And then it's really about this idea of we may have properties like in Garberville where we're in each other's defensible space. The guidance or the regulations only go to the property line, but we're sharing that component of responsibility for each other. And what do you do if your neighbor's just not interested? What do you do? Keep talking about it. <laughs> Talk about it. What do you do, Christina? <laughs> you don't know. What do you do? Move it. Invite them to come to these events. Call them out. Call them out, maybe? No, buy them out. Oh, you can buy them out. No. Yeah, maybe. What else do you do? Get them to join your fire safe council. Get them to join your fire safe council. I think there's a lot to do with modeling. And even if other people aren't interested, I've given up on a lot of neighbors. But I really make my place clean, and that's affected them. Where over a period of time they go, whoa, you know, this can be done. And even my 70 year old does it, I can do it too. So okay. you're my hero. That's what I wanted someone to say. Lead by example. Be the first one. Be the first one. Don't be afraid to say, I can't do, you know, cut off that thought process if you say, I can't do it if my neighbor can't do it. Well, they're never going to do it if you don't do it, right? So lead by example. All right, people always talk about fire safe plants. Anybody got, got that in their, in their quiver of tools? Good. That's a, that's a really interesting one because some plants, well, you, it, there's, um, you really hold on to them because they're important for one reason mm -hmm. or another. And then, then the question comes up about how flammable is that plant compared to other plants? Like some are obviously very flammable, and then you get like maybe say like a hydrangea, for example, right next to the house. Maybe not so flammable, you know. That's a question that comes up for me. Can you and I both buy lavender this spring? <laughs> How do we start out? It's lush, right? Yeah. Gets beautiful blooms. Where are we this fall? Yeah, it's dry. woody, dry. It's drier. Where are we in the spring? It's even worse. <laughs> You're, yeah. you're staying home and you're getting to maintain it. Me, I work too much. So mine doesn't look good, does it? Same plant. Could have the same label, but we take care of it very differently, right? As, you know, illustrated by what you can do. So our statement is really that placement is way important than plant type. I don't care what plants you plant. Just put them in the right place and keep them out of the wrong places. Plant what's beautiful for you and maintain it. 
Thank you. Oh, on the tubs fire, mm -hmm. I saw one house had a metal roof, stucco walls, and it burned because it had juniper planted right up underneath the eaves. Right. Exactly. Please. Placement. Very flammable piece of vegetation, but placement matters. Okay, getting to wrapping this up. So we talked about some of these vulnerable locations, right? And I'm going to talk about a few of those specifically. These are illustrations of foundation vents, and we're moving away from these widescreen vents to a much smaller screen. And do you know why? Embers. 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 And why does size matter? The smaller the ember, the less fire. Size of the embers, and why does that matter? Correct, but also there's less energy in those smaller embers, so they're not, they're less likely to ignite <clears throat> something else. They're going to fizz out. Like grassland embers are not very, they can transmit, but they don't necessarily create a land and create a receptive fire condition. We also live in a wet climate. Anyone ever painted their house with a spray gun? Super easy to clog these vents up. So part of what comes with this is an understanding there's a little more additional maintenance to make sure you protect those because you need to let the moisture out. Absolutely, really critical. So there's a whole set of new vents. Chapter 7A, I mentioned that earlier. That's the new wildland exterior construction codes. These vents all meet flame and ember resistance. So the example in Colorado with the flames pushing up against the wall, these would, these would be helpful and compliant. They have different systems. This has an intumescent paint. Isn't that kind of a cool word? Intumescent, basically, it seals up. It's fire activated and it oozes and it will clog up this honeycomb structure so you can watch it in action. It smells really bad. It's got a single use, but who cares? If you only have to replace the vent, who cares? These three are made out of stainless steel. This is a kind of a tortured path. It's like one of those fancy under um, uh, stove vents that you can pull down. So the fl you know, flames have to go like that. I have to admit, this is sort of my favorite one these days. Nothing goes through it. This has a stainless steel mesh. It's a through roof vent. So there's different systems. And there's opportunities to upgrade your vents. If you are not ready to do that, can you make this vent look like, can you make that vent look like this vent? Sure. How do you do that? Extra layer. Extra layer. Staple gun. Roll a screen. Not hard, right? Maybe. Not the plastic kind. Not the plastic kind. Thank you. Stainless steel or steel. Okay. That's the vents. Here's one illustration. I think you sent this one to me, Christina, of, of uh, someone's effort to change the attachment point between two structures. Huge space for innovation. Anybody looking for a new job, a new side hustle? I'm, I'm serious. Like there is nobody working in this space around attachments and gates, and there's a huge opportunity to really come in and be able to offer beauty, offer the functional privacy, and make it accessible right now. I, I kind of want to do it, but I have a day job. So if anyone wants to join me in that or just wants to lead, I'd be all for it. I mean, think about with a CNC machine, you could you could really in plate steel, you could make some really cool looking gates. So thank you to Kathy for these beautiful illustrations. Uh, we are going to be some heavy pushers today on the wildfire prepared home and set of guidance. Maybe you should pass this out, Connor, because I think everyone needs one of these. This is the short form of what we're talking about. But the basic idea is that you need a Class A roof. Anybody know what a Class A roof is? Not shingles, right? Can it be roll roofing? Yes, but roll reefing takes an assembly, so you need to have a certain pound felt paper and you need to have plywood underneath it, not OSB. So uh, metal roofing is a standalone class A, fiber cement siding or shingles. No, I didn't say that right. Uh, composition shingles are class A standalone. Basically, you can't hire a contractor and get anything less than class A these days. But for those of you that are doing it yourself, think about the fact that you want to create fiber resistance in your roof. And why in your roof? Why does the roof matter so much? The embers will land on it. It's the largest horizontal part of your building. It's the collector. It's doing all the work. It's the hat for your building. When you wrap it around and put a gutter on it, you need to have a metal drip edge, which is a piece of flashing, so that if you get ignition in the gutter, you don't get fire from the gutter underneath your roofing. 
Is that flashing expensive, Douglas? No. It's not. Is it easy to install? Easy. easy to install. That's right. Roof to wall flashing. So the idea that if you could increase the hardening along that transition area, because if it's a wind event, even if you've cleaned your roof and kept everything off of it, if you got a wildfire and it's fall, you're likely to get more debris coming down that day. So trying to put this in the best position possible is the goal. What do we do about skylights? Keep them clean. Keep them clean. In, in, it might strike you, interestingly, the dome skylights actually do pretty well because they have that shape and they shed the debris off of them. So the flat skylights have a lot of debris that can collect on top of them. It's just a rough point. You just have to watch it and maintain it. What about what's underneath the deck? Anybody store something underneath the deck? Yep. Does it need to live there? No. And why is it there? It's out of sight, out of mind, right? Tucked it away. Maybe it's time for a yard sale. Okay, so how do we prioritize all of this? We think about the roof, the vents, and the vegetation that's closest to the house as the most important pieces. Everyone has that, everyone can manage that. The moment we get a house that's overhanging a, a slope, then you've got that under area of the deck, that becomes critically important. And why is that? Fire goes uphill. Fire goes uphill, and when it does that, it also sends a whole lot of heat and starts preheating what's up above it and starts to further uh, bringing the moisture out of it and it becomes more likely to ignite. When you get buildings close to each other, and we're using the term 30 feet right now, still trying to work on exactly what that might be, then there's some additional things that you might do. So if you've got a detached garage and it's close to your house, well maybe you upgrade the windows between your two structures to the tempered glass windows. Is that doable? Maybe. Maybe. You could add deployable metal shutters. You could figure out other systems to kind of harden the structure from each other. Okay, so I'm wrapping up here. You think I'm crazy in my argument that there's reason for hope in this space? No, not sure. No, not sure. <laughs> You're not sure? Well, I'm a survivor of the Paradise Fire. Okay. So this is all very personal and very interesting. And much of what you say, I totally agree with. But some of it I can. Okay. Thank you for listening to me. I, I love your doings. Thank you, and I'm sorry for your, for your loss in your community. The point I'm trying to make is, five years ago, were any of us talking about these things? Not at all. Do we understand them better now? Do we see the pathways? And the possibility for change once you understand the pathway is so much greater than just feeling like it's all overwhelming, right? So in my mind, now that we understand that it's reasonably predictable, I think we can figure out how to make a difference for it. We clearly need unified messaging. We clearly need that guerrilla campaign around kale. We clearly need the nurse care model to be able to help us think better about how we manage our homes. But you all are part of that change moment, right? You all are the messengers and the carriers and the caretakers of your communities. So I hope when you leave today, you can at least have a few ideas of things you weren't thinking about and, think, and tools and resources you can bring home. And I just, you know, my heart's out to you all and the great work you do. Tam, I don't know how I'm doing on time, probably long, um, but I'm okay? Okay, so what do, you, what do we do here? Clean that up. Yeah. Move? Move. <laughs> what do we do, Ryan? <laughs> It's Sign up for the alerts. Oh, okay. <laughs> because this house got some work on it, doesn't it? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, we're going to get the weed whacker out, right? And we're going to do some trimming. These, these worry me a little bit. I would be making sure I signed up for the alerts and really be thinking about it each, each season because there's, there's a lot of work to do here. It's going to take some time, but there's lots of different strategies. What do we do here? <laughs> Get rid of them Jennifer bushes.
You know what I do when I meet the homeowner? I go, oh my God, you live in the most beautiful place. <laughs> Look at their view, right? Yeah, but. I find the heart in that moment. That's home for them, right? That's maybe all they have. And so my question would be, how can I help you? What's doable? The risk is these openings, right? That's metal. We can move this. We can harden this. And all the wood cladding around the edge. The wood cladding here? No, up on top. Up on top? Yeah. I mean, there's work to do, clearly. But what happens if that person who lives in that home gets loses their home? They're homeless. They're homeless. They're probably uninsured. There's little safety net in that space. We've got to figure out how to help people that this is their paradise, and they have a really good view. How about here? Yeah, there's a lot of stored stuff here. It's easier said than done, isn't it? Yeah. This roof to wall piece, what's underneath the deck. But there's a lot of things that are right here. I mean, they've got quite a bit of clearance. How long would it take to do that? A couple hours, right? It's a couple hours worth of work. Not too bad. How about here? All of that's bad news. What are we doing here? Just remove that whole thing. Just get rid of the whole thing. It's got to go. Move your wood pile away from the room. Can't you clear it out? Put a wall around it. Why couldn't we enclose that? Because maybe the property line is really close and you can't move it somewhere else. But that is a huge vulnerability. It even has a sign that says fire only there. That's where the fire yeah, is supposed does, to happen. It? <laughs> I love it. Yeah. How about here? <laughs> Wooden overhangs. Just, yeah, roofs on top of roofs. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah. Their paradise, their home, right? Nothing wrong with where they're at, but let's help figure out how to lift and lift and work the pathway. So these edges here, you can already see the decay that's happening along this line. The roof to wall intersection here. There's no gutters, so you don't have to worry about the metal drip edge. So that's, that's a plus. Hard to see what's happening here. A lot of debris down slope of this, of this structure. A couple days work, we can make a lot of improvement here. So with that, I'm gonna close and let you know that there's a lot of resources available and we can talk through your particular situation. Everyone has a unique, unique element with their house and I'm really looking forward to coming back in a few years and seeing how far you all have advanced. I would say it's amazing progress in just a couple of years. So thank you for being great stewards of your community. Thank you, Jan Velikovic, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, next up, uh, going to...